Welcome to Shapers and Builders, the show about better ways to deliver great software products. Today I'm speaking with Ryan Singer, former head of strategy at Basecamp. Ryan went through nearly every role in the product development stack during his 17-year tenure with the company, from UI design to programming to product management and most recently product strategy. In 2019, Ryan formalized the way that Basecamp was working into a framework that other companies could use, resulting in the release of the book Shape Up, Stop Running in Circles and Ship Work That Matters. Since then, a lot has happened and many teams have adopted and adapted Shape Up. Ryan, in turn, has taken these learnings from those teams to reshape the framework and decouple it more and more from the specific context of Basecamp, a bootstrapped and stable business with a high share of senior people. In our conversation, we explore some of the initial reactions to ShapeUp, including common criticism of the framework. We then go deeper into the evolution of ShapeUp 1.0 into the 2.0 version, which Ryan is now teaching in his course, Shaping in Real Life. You'll probably get the most out of this interview if you're already somewhat familiar with the ShapeUp framework. If you want to catch up on context first, check the show notes for some links to get started. I'm particularly excited to have Ryan on today because this episode actually kicks off the first season of the Shapers and Builders podcast, where I'll be speaking with teams of all sizes and stages to hear their stories of adopting ShapeUp, how and why they've introduced it to their companies, and the tweaks they've made along the way. If you're curious to hear some real-life case studies of teams working with ShapeUp, make sure to subscribe and check out the other episodes of the show. But enough introduction, let's get into the conversation. Hey Ryan, it's such a pleasure to be speaking to you again. I want to talk to you about ShapeUp today and how this framework has evolved over the past three to four years. So to start things off, can you give us the 90 second introduction to what ShapeUp is? Oh, <laughs> good challenge. Um... Well, I usually start with uh, why somebody would even get interested in it. Um, people usually get interested in shape up when the develop the development process they're using isn't working. So, uh, if you're using something like Scrum and you're finding out that you know there's a lot of meetings and there's a lot of time going by and there's sprint after sprint, but stuff actually isn't getting finished. And you start to think, okay, is there another way that we can do our product development that's that's going to work better? Also, I see uh, startups who are just kind of doing everything organically, you know, without any structure at all, but then they reach a certain stage where they start to grow. And it's kind of like, okay, now we need some process, but we know that we don't want to just mindlessly, you know, file tickets and think that that's also going to help us to actually ship quality work. So it's usually either coming from a standpoint of like, how can we ship better or how can we kind of give the teams more autonomy so that leadership has more time to work on other things. And uh, it's, yeah, stepping back from this kind of typical agile thing that we've seen where it's like two weeks at a time and very ticket based. And instead of actually asking the question of, what is it strategically that we want to do and how do we put our heads together to solve the really important unknowns and have a kind of strategy about what it is that we're going after and what it is that we're trying to build. So uh, actually bringing people together to do what's called shaping, which is like figuring out the overall architecture and the key trade-offs of what we're going to build in such a way that the build team actually has more freedom and more autonomy to make decisions inside the delivery phase and they can actually get things done on time. Something like that, you know, I think uh, it's hard to, it's hard to boil it down to 90 seconds, but usually those are some of the, the factors that are driving people. Yeah, perfect. And we'll get into much more depth. But you, you published the book on ShapeUp in 2019 and recently launched a course around it called Shaping in Real Life. Why was that necessary? Well, you know, the original book, Shape Up, came out in 2019, and it formalized all the things that we learned at Basecamp over the 17 years that I was there. And those things w were, you know, when the book first came out, 
there were a whole bunch of companies that immediately adopted it. You know, they were like, this makes perfect sense to us. We can, we're going to work in six week cycles. Like the book says, we're going to do shaping before we start the, the actual cycles. We're going to do cool down. Like they did all the things that were in the book. But then a lot of people started coming to me and saying, oh, we're doing parts of shape up or we're trying to use pieces of it. And what I understood was that the companies who were just like Basecamp, they were able to just take everything in the book and run with it. But companies who weren't like Basecamp, uh, they weren't actually able to use it, but they still needed, it's funny, they were still trying and they were still kind of twisting it and adapting it so that it could be something that they could use. And when I say companies that were not like Basecamp, what I mean is companies that were VC backed instead of bootstrapped. So they have different pressures. Companies that have more of a gap between junior and senior people uh, instead of having mainly senior people. Uh, Companies that are significantly larger, where you have like a thousand people in the organization instead of just 50. Especially companies where the ratio of designer to, to developers is much different. At Basecamp, every single build team had a dedicated full time product designer, somebody who could do interaction design and front end design and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And a lot of software companies have more of a one to 10 ratio where there's, you know, like 10 for, for every 10 programmers, there's only one designer and sometimes even fewer than that. And so a lot of the stuff that's in the book doesn't translate directly for them. So I had people reaching out to me again and again saying, how do we make this work for us? And what I understood was that instead of taking this single package where like you have to do all of these things exactly as they're written, that it was actually possible to break apart what's in the book into separate individual practices that teams can adopt. So what are different things that we can do to shape? What are different ways that we can create a time box for ourselves that's meaningful instead of just two week sprints? And a lot of the things that kind of people thought were sacred uh, turn out to be much more flexible, like the this length of the cycles or mm-hmm. how you involve designers at which phase, the latitude that you shape at, whether it's rough marker, like this like fat marker sketch, yeah. or sometimes you actually need to define more detail up front. Sometimes you need to define less detail up front. So this like kind of setting the dial on what is the right amount of information to include when you shape. There's also some really interesting things that we found out about, you know, in the original book, we have what's called the betting table. And there's this idea that somehow a set of pitches are going to come to the betting table. And then there's going to be a choice of like, which thing are we going to build in the next cycle? But that actually presumes that there's enough time to prepare and meaningfully shape multiple pitches right? Which very often isn't the case at a lot of companies. This was a luxury that Basecamp had. So what we what I often saw actually was that teams who were trying to follow the Basecamp way, but they didn't, they weren't structured like Basecamp, they would end up very superficially shaping. You know, they would have like a bunch of pitches, but they weren't really getting into the nuts and bolts of why is this viable and how is the hip bone going to connect to the leg bone and like what is the mechanism that we're actually going to make they were much more like kind of like sales pitches you know here's a reason why we should add this feature here's a reason why we should do this we should build something in response to this request we're always getting from customers and um a lot of what we end up starting to well like actually a lot of what this course teaches is how to really recognize the difference between just making a sales pitch where the product team is saying, here's why we should do something. And then it all lands on the laps of the developers and they have no idea what the real requirements are and, you know, Mm -hmm. what success or done looks like. And um, stepping away from that and figuring out how do we actually put product and engineering together in the shaping session so that we have a more meaningful understanding of what we're really getting into. And we actually start to make some trade-offs together and understand what we're proposing. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, so you mentioned who the course is for. Um, was that also what you then observed in the first cohort that you had, that this mix of people from larger companies, VC-backed, kind of growth-driven companies? Yeah, Or was sure. it still very much the, the core bootstrapped scene? You know, there. what I saw was that um, there were some folks who originally fell into the core bootstrapped kind of group mm -hmm. but then since then they're, they're they've hired a lot more people and they've had to deal with problems that they didn't have to deal with in the first place so we saw some folks who were originally very small bootstrap teams but since then they've grown and now they have new new difficulties but actually the majority of folks who've come into the course have been people from vc backed companies from larger companies uh smaller teams inside of bigger companies who are trying to make this work for them. Mm -hmm. And do you hear from um, participants kind of how they then are able to translate what they learn in the course in their teams? Because it's, you know, I assume it's a big challenge knowing what you know and then applying that in your team going back home and, and the team might not have been in the course and have that context. Yeah, that's interesting. We're seeing different things there. For some people, they have this a big aha moment. So I've had some cases where the the founders or somebody who's like VP of engineering or somebody who's mm -hmm. head of product, they're saying in, in the Q&A during the course, they're saying like, oh, wow, I didn't realize like what, what we called shaping was actually just framing what we were going to do. And we weren't actually getting enough into the detail. And like, mm -hmm. no wonder we were always having these problems in the build cycle, right? Like, They were having kind of just these big like aha moments. Another thing was that we saw a lot of people trying to shape asynchronously instead of actually putting their heads together into live shaping sessions. And there were some big ahas there too of like, oh, wow, like, okay, so I'm going to go back to my team. And instead of sending documents back and forth for discussion or for comments, mm. let I'm actually going to put this, you know, we talk about how to choose a technical shaper in the course. And there's people who say, you know, I, I already know who represents kind of the customer knowledge, mm -hmm. but here's it. Now I have the technical person in mind and we're going to bring those people together and ask them to do a shaping session. And I'm really excited to try that. So that's something that we hear. So some people are able to just run with it because they kind of see what they couldn't see before. And they also kind of understand the practices enough to kind of guide people through what a shaping session is going to look mm -hmm. like and how they're going to actually run that or how they're going to package the work differently. That's also something we talk about. Um, the other thing is like uh, taking things, for example, from, from the point where there's a shaped packaged piece of work that's ready to go to giving that to a junior programmer and saying how, saying, how can I actually trust them that they're going to be able to run with this, you know, without a lot of management for six weeks. You know, we, we teach, for example, the handoff exercise there. Mm -hmm. And those are, that's, that's the kind of thing where people go like, oh, I'm going to go try that. I think I can see how to do that. There are other cases where uh, people have said that there's, they want their teams to really learn this language to be able to, we talk about judging what room are we in? You know, there's mm -hmm. kind of this, this mindset of like, we're trying to do some work and sometimes it's very clear what the problem is and we're just debating different solutions. So we're kind of in a shaping yeah. phase. Sometimes we're trying to shape something and we're just going in circles because nobody can even agree what the problem is. And then that's mm -hmm. the kind of thing where it's like, oh, we're not actually ready to shape this. We need to step back and frame what is the actual problem or build the business case for like why to spend time on this problem instead of that problem because we're not agreeing on what's worth spending time on. So identifying the difference between when we're framing, when we're shaping, when we're spiking, when we're in packaging and when we're actually moving into delivery, those are all kind of different kinds of work where we're asking different questions and we're taking in different things that we've already solved to carry them forward into the next step. And some of the people want their whole teams to be able to speak that language in order to start kind of better problem solving the different things that are going on in the development process. Yeah. So I've seen cases where folks have actually brought their whole team through. So they said, can we do a private cohort? And then they bring the whole team through 
Uh, and then, and then they have, you know, six people or 10 people go through as a batch to, to, to all get up to speed on the same language. So then they can yeah. go into these framing sessions and shaping sessions and they have more common language to actually get through that. Yeah. After the book came out, I certainly felt a lot of reactions to it. Some were very positive, um, but some were also quite critical. So what I'd like to do with you is a, a quick fire round of the most common criticism or maybe misconceptions <laughs> you tell us okay. right, um, <laughs> around ShapeUp and get your take on these. Would you be up for that? Yeah, certainly. Okay, so I have a, I have a list of five. And uh, I'm just going to read them out to you, and then you can kind of uh, react to them wh whichever way you see sure. fit. The first one I have here, I call the lonely genius shaper. And the, the quote I dug up here was, it smacks at times of the genius solo designer crafting their masterpiece and doing the deep work while the team executes. I'm pretty sure, sure that was not the intent, but it is, Im it is implied in a couple of places. That's a very good criticism. You know, um, what we've seen, this is also coming to base, what the experience at Basecamp versus the wider world. We had the situation at Basecamp where the people who were doing the shaping represented three kind of very different areas of expertise. When you're doing shaping, someone has to represent what is actually technically practical to do what is technically possible. So someone has to have deep technical knowledge. Mm -hmm. Someone has to understand what's actually valuable to the customer. You know, someone has to understand the interaction design. So there's these, these different areas that all have to come together in the shaping to come up with something that is going to be viable and it's going to be fun to work on. That's going to be meaningful. Yeah. And we were in a situation where we had a lot of those skills kind of in the same people. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of cases at Basecamp where one or two people could lock themselves in a room, shape a concept and bring it to the team. And when we gave it to the team, the team wasn't saying, oh, you know, here, here we have another concept coming from product where they don't know what they're talking about. And they tell mm -hmm. us that we should go build this. Right. You know, usually when that happens, you see a really big disconnect where the product people come up with an idea And then they make a whole bunch of drawings and stuff like that. And then they bring it to the technical people, like, here's your work. And the technical people are like, this isn't at all executable the way that you mm -hmm. think it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and that's, of course, that's a frustrating situation. Yeah. Now, when the person who's doing the shaping actually is really close to the technical people or even works with the technical people, mm. you know, it can be that you give that work to the technical people and they say, awesome, I'm really excited to work on this. This is something that is doable and makes a lot of sense to us and we're eager to start on it, you know? So the, the thing that's really important for teams to be successful with this is to bring the right people together into the shaping sessions. Mm -hmm. So at a minimum, make sure that it's not just the, the, you know, the artist with the, with the, with the beret, who's going to make the, <laughs> the giant Figma drawing and then say, here, I've solved it all. Right. Um, yeah. But to have actually have the have the person who looks at it from the design perspective and very importantly, the technical person. In fact, the technical person is a is a huge critical piece of a successful shaping session because what we're shaping is is a piece of software. It's actually something that needs to get built. So the technical piece is critical to be there from the absolute beginning. So. We usually talk about three roles, you know, bringing the, the, the product person who really understands what the customer is trying to do, the design person who understands kind of what is going to make sense in terms of getting from A to B in the interface and in the flows, and then mm. the technical person who understands what can be built, what can what we can execute, and then the three of them can all make trade-offs together. And then when specific questions come up about what is viable or what is practical, actually doing spikes, and that might involve doing you know, a little bit of deeper work on the technical side to figure out if something that we think we're going to do in this concept is actually something that's realistic or if there are unknowns there that are going to blow up. Right. So, yeah, yeah, I think, I think if you, if you take the shaping and you think that, that now like our designers or our product people are going to solve it all and give it to the technical people, that's definitely a, that's definitely a mistake. And we need to bring the technical people into the shaping process 
but recognize that it's a different type of work that happens and it's under a different clock. It's not something where we, when we're inside of a time box and we've committed to do a project, that clock is ticking, right? Mm -hmm. Versus when we're in the shaping phase, we can throw out, we can throw out the whole project and completely take a right turn and go down a different direction because of something that we discovered together. So it's not as much about the shaper, but it's about the activity of shaping needing to happen, right? Yes, exactly. It's about not just going into a delivery time box where we're supposed to be shipping something when we don't actually know what it is that we're shipping and we yeah. haven't done the we haven't done the diligence to make sure that we know what we're doing and that it's viable. Yeah. So the, th the second item I have on my list is in shape up teams aren't really empowered. And the quote I have for you is I do worry that it is heavily biased to certain perspectives about the role of designers, leaders, teams, etc. It's surprisingly disempowering approach for a team, but they make a point of talking about empowering teams. Mm. So I, I'm not sure if 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 they if somebody was speaking from experience when they said that they found it disempowering because what we hear from the teams who adopt it is is very much the opposite. We're not trying to sell anything here as empowering. This is this is a quote from people who've adopted it. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a standard approach is figure out what we're going to do. So a lot of software companies, what happens? There's either a main Even if they're, they say that they're agile, even if they're scrum, somebody is coming up with the concept of what's going to get built. Yeah, It's happening somehow. And that's either in the form of an architecture from a senior technical person, or it might be a bunch of Figma files from designers. Somebody is creating something that is like the thing we're going to go build. And what happens on a typical team today is that work then gets split into tickets and those tickets get assigned And that's what the technical people are responsible to do. They're responsible for completing tickets. Yeah. In the shape up model, there's no step of assigning, of breaking the work into tickets. And then this is your ticket. And that's what you're responsible for. The team is given the, the overall concept of this is the thing that we think we can go build. So they, the team is given the shaped concept and then they work out for themselves what the actual tasks are how they want to implement that. They make trade-offs. There's latitude for them to make changes to what was defined in the shaped work. So mm -hmm. when we talk about empowerment, I think it's mainly contrasted against this environment where you are just executing tickets and then somehow the tickets are all supposed to fit together. You know, like somebody created all the Lego bricks for you and your job is just to make them so that they will all snap together in the end. Instead, what we have is that the team is actually responsible for the whole thing coming together and they are figuring out how to integrate and how to design all the different pieces so that this thing actually does what it was intended to do. Yeah, I think it, the criticism, I mean, I'm speculating 100% here, but I think it might come from... Um, from a perspective where you know now there's kind of streams uh, streams of thought within the product community that are pushing engineers to be uh, super involved in in discovery speaking with customers and spending time on that side of of kind of of the product uh turf if you will um which wouldn't be part of kind of the standard shape up setup right That, I actually think it is part of the standard sh shape up setup, and it just doesn't didn't come cl through clearly enough in the book. If you really read, if you really read carefully, you will see that from the very introduction, shaping is described as an activity that integrates design, product, and technical knowledge. There is no way that you can shape something if you don't have the technical factor in there, mm -hmm. and that has to be there. Absolutely. It's just that I don't think I made the point clearly enough in the book. I said that the shaper needs to be technically literate. And I think that that didn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're working in an environment where the product is mostly kind of just reading and writing from a database and the interface layer is really thin, then technical literacy is actually maybe enough. But in a lot of cases where people are working on, you know, that's it's it's not so simple. Fundamentally, though, 
you you need to have that technical knowledge all the way at the beginning of the process when you're figuring out is this a viable path that we want to go down or not when you're shaping that's that's essential yeah the third item i have here is it works because of the stability slash stagnation at base camp you know base camp is growing but stable small team no venture back growth goals very tight founding group a single product with a narrow scope so there's truth to that it, the the specific practices that the book argues six week long cycles two weeks of cool down uh shaping multiple pitches during uh in parallel and then and then bringing those to the betting table to decide for the next cycle um no roadmap at all basically <laughs> all of those <laughs> those specifics are completely related i think stagnation isn't fair but they are um they they completely are related to the fact that base camp was bootstrapped and base camp ran on yeah. had the luxury of doing things Uh, completely on their own schedule. And any company who's bootstrapped, whether you are, um, you know, fat and happy because you've reached a mm -hmm. lot of success, or if you are, you know, I did a recently, I did a project where we had one part-time programmer and we had very, very little budget. Mm -hmm. It was this like shoestring budget with one part-time programmer, but we were bootstrapped. And it's funny because it felt like working at base camp because we mm -hmm. could go on as long as we wanted. You know, there was no external yeah. <laughs> pressure that we had to finish because yeah. our costs were so low and that everything was so was so small that if we wanted to just keep going three more cycles because we thought it was meaningful, that wasn't a problem for us. So being self-funded and, and having really low costs, this enables you to work that way. Um, so I think that that objection is coming more for probably from somebody who's in an environment where they have more external pressures. Yeah. And of course, if you have investors, you cannot just go cycle after cycle, six weeks at a time doing whatever you feel like, right. Yeah. Whatever feels meaningful to you. And in that situation, this is where we actually see a lot of teams doing shape up, but varying the length of the cycle actually setting the time box ad hoc on a per project basis mm -hmm. so they might say look here's something that's burning that's really critical that's important that we need to do we want to be able to get it done in the next three weeks now but if we just go and talk to the developers and sit around a table and then start building something we know that our likelihood of actually shipping at the end of the three weeks isn't high enough Yeah. That this is likely to just spiral out of control or, you know what I mean? We're going to get, we're going to get into some technical area that was more complicated than we thought, yeah. or there's going to be miscommunications, blah, blah, blah. So you can be under tight deadlines, two weeks, three weeks, and still say, okay, but in order to use those two or three weeks effectively and ship something at the end of it, we need to do a shaping session first, right? We need yeah. to actually be clear about what it is that we're betting on so i think that's more a reaction to the pacing and the cadence mm -hmm. and the six weeks than it is to the actual uh to the actual process the next thing i have on here is is a bit connected and it says there's no way i could justify the team sitting idle during cooldown basically for 25 of the time assuming a six week cycle plus two week cooldown rhythm That sounds to me like the perspective of somebody who is uh, under pressure from investors. And I've heard this from teams who are VC backed. And they said, there's no way that we can have something called cool down. Yeah. So what we ended up doing <laughs> was created something called ramp up. <laughs> <laughs> Because the thing is, if, if, if the team is actually completely focused inside of the time box, whether it's six weeks or whether it's three weeks, whatever it is, where they are just totally heads down delivering something that is extremely valuable and that's well-shaped and then they, they actually ship that at the end of that time, there are going to be a lot of little loose ends lying around that need those people's attention. Mm -hmm. There's going to be the little thing that marketing needs. There's yeah. going to be the little bit of tech debt that, you know, there's going to be this infrastructure issue. There's going to be 
alignment meetings that need to happen or different kinds of um, meetings that are between different people who couldn't meet because their heads were down before. So they're, if they were indeed really focused during that time box, there's going to be a lot of like other stuff that has been waiting for their attention, you know? And, and then at the same time, if you are going to be really deliberate and strategic about what happens in the next three weeks or the next six weeks, there needs to be time for everyone to pull their heads up, look around and understand like, where, where are we actually going next? And that might mm-hmm. involve having a couple shaping sessions or doing a little bit of spiking before feeling like we can turn on the green light to start the next focused effort. So that ramp up time where we actually f- figure out what's next and we coordinate with each other and we take care of all the little things that have come up in between, I mean, that is functionally going to be really necessary and valuable. It's not that everyone is sitting around idle. It's, it's, it's the difference between we are targeting our efforts toward a very specific project that we have scheduled as opposed to we are giving ourselves the room that we need for all the unpredictable little things that that are going to need our time so that we can again focus on the next focused effort. Yeah. On your website, you have this video called Shaping in a Nutshell. And I think in that video, you speak about um, also two ways to split the kind of the strategic work versus the reactive work. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like that might be connected to to what you just said, where kind of my following question would be uh, in, a, in a setting where you have separate tracks for these kinds of works, do you still see teams using cooldown on the strategic tracks themselves? Or ramp up, sorry, <laughs> to stick with this. Yes. Yeah, tracks. well, depending on the team, sometimes <laughs> cooldown, sometimes ramp up. Yeah, we see teams mm-hmm. doing, a, doing a, sometimes a week-long pause in between the planned efforts. But it's just, it's just because if you're going to do a project, you know, projects have a start and an end yeah. and there has to be some coordination in between. And the idea that you're going to ship on Friday, I mean, that you're going to ship a major effort on a Friday and then kick off a major new effort, a multi-week major effort on Monday yeah. It's just not going to happen. That's just not how life is. You can't do yep. that. You need you need some time in between to coordinate. You know, um, so that time just has to be there. Whether mm-hmm. it's two weeks or not, um, that can depend. You know, on on the other things that are going on. And this thing that you mentioned about the difference between the planned work and the reactive work. This is a big, big, big thing too. This is really important to recognize. One of the things that teams struggle with is sometimes they try to adopt shape up and they think now that all software development should happen in some kind of a shape up way. Mm -hmm. And that is simply not the case. If you're, so the reactive work is work that is not only small, you know, we think about bugs and little issues coming up from support or like marketing Mm -hmm. needs this thing. It's not only small, It's the fact that it has urgency attached to it from a stakeholder somewhere. It's the fact that it's on fire that makes it reactive and that you can't decide when you're going to do it. There are a ton of little bugs and little technical debt things that are small and they're bad, but they're not urgent. Nobody is saying like, I need this in three days. And if I don't have it, I'm blocked and it's a problem for us. Right? Yeah. So... Uh, the reactive work, it has that urgency. And that's that's why it's a problem for project-based work because it interrupts us because of the mm-hmm. because of the urgency. And so this is why I literally am telling people, don't use Shaba for that. A ticket-based process is way more suited for that kind of work. Mm-hmm. A Kanban is way more appropriate for that kind of work because you are trying to get the fastest flow from step to step to step so that you can get that urgent thing done, you know? So separate capacity using a separate process, much more ticket oriented, whereas we're not in the ticket world in shape up, but very much in the ticket world for the reactive stuff. Yeah. This, by the way, includes project work where you do not control the schedule of all of the participants. So you might think of, let's say, an integration with a client 
you know, or you have to in, do an integration with a, with, a, with a third party. And that might seem to be a project. But if you are going to be waiting on the client or the vendor or the third party to do their part of the integration work and get back to you, you're not going to be able to do that in a shape up model because you don't control the time box. So that would be yeah. much better to uh, to move that over to a Kanban and think of it as more of a ticket based process. The last item on my list of top criticism or misconceptions yeah. mm -hmm. is um, shape up is just mini waterfalls. Teams execute a project and never look back to check, for example, if the intended impact materialized. There's no iteration. So I would ask, is this about it's teams never look back to figure out what happened. So is this is this saying that um, once something is launched, that then there's no opportunity to evaluate whether it was successful and to improve it or something like that? That's my read of it. Yes. So if we first of all, if we are indeed shipping something and that piece of work is finished and it goes out into the world, now we can really get the feedback that we need you know because we've shipped now we can iterate because we actually have meaningful feedback from the market from customers from real behavior out there in the field uh, a lot of times i think the what gets called iteration in a in a more of a scrum context is actually a never-ending project you know It's like, we're going to keep making it better and we're going to keep making it better and better and better. And we're still not ready to ship it because it's not better enough. It's not good enough. It's not perfect enough. Yeah. And then what ends up happening is there's so much time that goes into it. The project drags on so long that by the time you finally ship it, you can't actually justify spending more time to improve it because now you have a giant backlog full of other things that you haven't finished, you know? Yeah. So Actually, the more that we can shape a targeted effort, spend a strategic amount of time on it, the three weeks, the four weeks, the six weeks, ship it, you know, now yeah. we can decide, do we want to shape a new project based on the feedback that we got from the world to, to make that better? Do we want to work on something that is a completely unrelated feature or do we want to extend the thing that we previously shipped or do we want to rethink the thing that we shipped and do it in a different way? I mean, all those possibilities are on the table, but we really need to have the actual real world feedback to know how to make it better. Yeah, I think from my experience, this uh, this critique of uh, mini waterfalls and not being iterative, it comes from, uh, from teams that um, are, are working a lot in the... MVP mindset, which oftentimes tends to be an excuse for shipping half as things because you can always iterate the next sprint and make it better, which which then doesn't happen. Is that something that you think shape up fixes or prevents in any way because you're more intentional about the the work? Well, I would say the first thing is that if people are happy with what they're doing, then there's no reason to to even switch mm -hmm. to shape up, right? So if someone is in some model where they are um, constantly iterating on things and they don't think of it in terms of shaping projects that they want to walk away from, then that's that's perfect for them. The place where shape up kind of becomes relevant is when the team starts to feel like, why are we never done? Mm. You know, when, when it starts to feel like a struggle that, We never seem to reach the point where we can say that this is actually done and we walk away from it because it's effective and it's doing what it was supposed to do, you know? So iteration yeah. is great when you are trying to get somewhere, but iteration isn't great when, when you're kind of wandering around and, mm -hmm. and nobody knows kind of what the, where the finish line is. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the conversation. I wanted to take a moment to thank you for listening and to let you know about the Shapers and Builders job board. On shapers.builders, yes, that's the domain, you'll find jobs in software development, design, product management, and other roles at companies that work with ShapeUp. Many of these roles are remote, and teams who use ShapeUp generally run at a more sustainable, healthy, and meaningful pace than the hamster wheel of two-week sprints. So if you're looking for a job in tech or trying to find great people, 
head over to the Shapers and Builders job board at shapers.builders. Now let's turn back to the conversation. So turning from criticism to a more joyous topic, I'd love to hear if you had any kind of positive surprises from teams using ShapeUp that you learned of. The, the number one positive surprise is that it continues and continues and continues to spread underground. If I were to use Twitter and LinkedIn or, you know, as a judge of what is going on in the industry, it doesn't match the picture that I get from all the private messages that I get from people. And that to me is like a totally surprising and like really interesting. Also, the the interest in the course has been really surprising and interesting um, that there are so many people who are aware of the fact that the way that they are doing their product development, you know, that there are all these disconnects and that scrum and all the kind of best practices that are out there that they aren't working, but somehow it's not, it's not something that's out there yet as a public conversation. You know, it's funny. We tried, <laughs> we tried to have like a, like a public shape up forum mm -hmm. when we first launched the book and it was just silent. And, mm -hmm. and, and I, and at the time I was a little bit disappointed even, you know, I was like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, nobody's using the forum and it's, you know, nobody cares about shape up. And, yeah. and of course, what I discovered was that the issues that the, that, the, that, that the book addresses are the really, really hard questions at the highest level in the company. I mean, mm -hmm. they're the, the questions that the C-level people are struggling with about like, like, why aren't, like, why are we so ineffective? Yeah. You know, and of course, you're not going to be a VP or a C or, or a C level person and go onto the public and to a public forum and then start talking about how ineffective your team is. Yeah, that's true. Although I have observed some um, some posts of, you know, I, I guess I know the firm you're talking about and there have been people sharing their struggles. Uh, but again, I think that the the first niche was just the kind of the bootstrappers community, if you want to call it that. Uh, and then the C level of those companies, I think. So and that's a different. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, there's been some of that. Yeah, yeah. I, especially those bootstrappers who were really close fit uh, that we saw some, yeah. some of those posts. The other thing that's really surprised me is how often I've seen a lot of teams where there's an engineering kind of department. Okay, so we're talking about a slightly bigger company. Mm -hmm. There's an engineering department and this engineering department is using something like Scrum. And the product folks have understood that giving the engineering people, you know, drawings and Figma drawings and, and all this stuff, you know, or a bunch of dis research from their discovery, that there's too big of a disconnect and everything is getting lost in translation and it's not working. And, and in my original kind of, yeah, like, vision of, of this whole thing. Like when I wrote the book, I thought, I thought that the way that the team does delivery was really important. Mm -hmm. Like from the moment the cycle starts until the moment of shipping, yeah. all this stuff about breaking the work into scopes and using hill charts and all of this, I really thought that that stuff was essential for doing shape up mm -hmm. because it was actually kind of the area where I was digging deeper in my own well, I don't know what you call it, like in my own development, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like as a practitioner, like that was the yeah. area that I was kind of geeking out on the most. And what I found out is that for 90% of teams, once you establish a time box, the beginning of the time box is just a starting gun. And then mm -hmm. once you fire that starting gun, it's just like off to the races and you cannot influence anything. <laughs> you cannot yeah. control anything. <laughs> yeah. And and what I found is that all the really like most of the leverage is actually in the shaping mm -hmm. and bringing 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 uh the experienced technical people into the shaping having that push and pull between the design concept and what is technically feasible in the shaping and that's so it's, it's just been amazing to me to see like the kind of results the teams are getting even when they still have to put the work through a paper shredder afterward yeah and that to me was like kind of a really kind of violated my sensibilities that mm -hmm. you could still have this paper shredder of splitting everything into tickets and then just assigning tickets and so on, or doing it in two week sprints or whatever, that even still just doing 
that shaping first had a huge impact on the team's ability to ship on time. So that was really surprising to me and really nice to see because it also means that, and this is a big part of why we ended up, you know, my wife and I created this uh, shaping in real life together. Mm -hmm. I was telling, like I had finished a consulting project and we were looking together at like all the new things that we did in this consulting project. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's, there's a whole new way to teach this. That's different than what's in the book, you know? And she was like, why why don't you, why don't we like, have you thought about making a course? Maybe Mm -hmm. we should make a course for this. And um, so that's been really interesting because now what we're seeing is that teams can pick off the practices that they want to choose. For example, like the, the framing and shaping steps. Yeah. And if they don't have influence over the way that the engineers work, that's okay. They can still have huge wins. And then gradually what I'm finding out is that introducing these new techniques inside of the delivery phase, like breaking things into scopes and, uh, working on a scope basis and Mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, dealing with the unknowns and stuff inside of that, like making making trade-offs inside of the delivery phase, the, using the hill chart inside of the delivery phase, that stuff is actually all kind of like advanced level. You know, yeah. once you really have shaped work and you have the, the folks who are in the delivery phase are feeling really engaged and they want to kind of take it to the next level, like then these things come in, but they're actually not at all necessary to start. Yeah. And I can definitely second what you said about this underground spread of shape up. I'm regu- uh, I'm often surprised myself when I'm speaking with other teams and they are saying, "Hey, you know, uh, we actually know of shape up. We we've tried it, or we're using parts of it." Mm-hmm. And um, just uh, two weeks ago, I was uh, interviewing and speaking with a with an agile coach. Uh, that was kind of the pinnacle of surprise for me that you know these people who are certified uh, in in safe and and kind of um that side uh where i felt like initially there was this divide between uh shape up and the scrum community mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. And, and now we have agile coaches that are can kind of implementing um shape up and in the, that case a huge company across 20 21 teams i think he said uh, so that's been a, a big surprise for me as well wow cool i even heard just yesterday i heard an interview with kent beck who I mm-hmm. greatly admire and learned so much from studying his work. I mean, like he's like on the very like top shelf of important influential people in the, in the world of agile and programming that I learned from, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, through studying XP and, and everything that he did. Um, but there was an interview with him and he said that he was really disappointed that he sees kind of what he called a, a, a reversion back to waterfall. Mm-hmm. in out there in 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 this in the industry today that there's a swing back toward upfront design and i'm listening to that and i'm thinking like i wonder <laughs> i wonder if it has anything to do with what we're talking about here you know <laughs> and of course of course we don't want to go back to that 90s style waterfall either yeah. this was also a big mistake you know what i mean so that's not what we're talking about but there is a trend toward more upfront thinking at least, you know, and it could possibly be misinterpreted by people who are really very uh, strongly agile in their mindset where they might, they might get nervous about that. I could understand that. Yeah. (laughs) Tying together kind of all the learnings that you had since launching the book in 2019, are you ready yet to tack on the 2.0 version label to shape up? And if so, what are the major upgrades that you see between shape up 2.0 2.0 and 1.0. I think 1.8 is the current version number that you have out there. You know, I actually think that um, uh, what we have in the in the shaping in real life material is fully is fully 2.0. Mm-hmm. Uh, the distinction between framing and shaping is actually really really important. Understanding when we are making the case to do something and and trying to pitch people to invest time in something as opposed to making the trade-offs and designing the system of how it's actually going to work. Those are very different kinds of things. We see product managers, business people doing what we now call framing, but they think it's shaping. Mm -hmm. And then, so they're saying, here are the 10 reasons why we should do this. Here are all the customers who are saying they want it. So let's go do it. 
And it's like, but wait a minute, like what's the actual concept? Yeah. Right. So this, um, and seeing how, you know, making the case to spend time on something requires going into data, doing different types of research. It's a different kind of work, uh, to make the business case as opposed to figure out the technical approach. So that's been very, very fundamental. And there's a lot related to that. Um, in, 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 in shape up, we talked about coming up with a concept and then kind of giving it to presenting it to technical people for them to somehow kind of push back and de-risk it or something like that. Yeah. And we even talked about this notion of rabbit holes in the pitch. Yeah. And this actually is the right idea, but in practice, there shouldn't be any rabbit holes in the pitch there. If, if something is a rabbit hole, we should solve it in shaping by doing spikes. Mm -hmm. We should go deeper into the concreteness in that area to figure out where do we actually hit the wall? Where are the breaking points in this, in this tricky area so that we can understand those things before we, before we make the commitment to do the project. So spiking and shaping is a very, very big thing. And we talk about kind of going in and out from shaping sessions into spiking sessions and so on. The fact that shaping is very much about actually looking at alternate ways to do things. Whenever we were shaping at base camp, we were always saying, what is the, what is the version of this that we could do in six weeks? We mm -hmm. were also saying, but what is the two week version? Mm -hmm. What is the quick hack version? What's the six month version? So thinking about alternate versions, option A, option B, option C, with different constraints in order to understand better what the possibilities are. This is something fundamental in shaping that we also teach now as uh, different paths. So what are the parts that we think go into the solution and what are different paths we can take under different constraints? Then when we go into the actual output of shaping, that the output of shaping, it doesn't make sense to call it a pitch because mm -hmm. a pitch is like a sales pitch, right? But if we've made the time investment, so if we framed it, we understood the business value, we think that it's worth spending some time on, we've shaped it, we've come up with what we think is a viable kind of system design or a viable architecture or a viable approach of what to build. Now, what we have is actually something we call the package. Mm -hmm. We package what was shaped so that it can go into delivery. So packaging means, you know, like, it's not just a bunch of scribbles on the wall and only those of us who were there understand what it means, but now it's in a document in a form that's going to survive the passage of time and the changing of hands. So yeah. this notion of packaging and then actually choosing the right level of latitude and what to spell out versus what to leave for the team to decide. This is something that happens in packaging. That's very much dependent on who we give the work to. So in shape up, there was this impression that, there's kind of a right way to write a pitch, you know, that it mm -hmm. should have a fat marker sketch and it should have this and it should have that. But actually what goes into the package, the package is what the team needs so that they can be successful in delivery and they can make judgment calls. So it might be that there are things that they need to know that are much more detailed about how some legacy thing works. You know, maybe there was some really old code that we had to carefully analyze in the shaping to understand what to do. And we could we should spell out exactly what we learned about that old code in that package if that's going to be relevant and if we actually got all the way down to a very concrete ui concept inside of the shaping and we understood in this particular project we don't want to have latitude for something else mm -hmm. but this very specific design this little piece of the design this little piece should actually be the way that we the way that we already defined it versus the other things you know, could change. So this idea of being much more, yeah, judicious, being much more conscious of what we put into the package so that it is the right thing that's going to help the team to be successful. Mm -hmm. And then of course, this also the handoff of this, this method that we teach for how to enable the team to give some feedback and show what they understand, uh, especially when you have a lot of junior people where they can kind of sketch out the scopes and their implementation approach before kickoff at the beginning of the mm -hmm. cycle so that there can be some back and forth between senior and junior to make sure that we're actually aligned and that the team is going to work on the biggest unknowns and the most important pieces first. And they're not going to 
bump into the, you know, the, the, they're not going to bump into the biggest difficulties on the in the eleventh hour at the last minute. So there's 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 quite a few things there. And the word package itself also, I think uh, it fits better the context that you mentioned in the beginning of um, teams who don't have the luxury to shape multiple competing pitches and then come together mm -hmm. to decide. Right? It's it's that exactly. it's the package that goes into delivery next. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Cool. Before we wrap up, I'd love to hear what's next for you. I know you've been speaking at quite a few conferences lately, Business of Software, the Product Conf, and you're running more cohorts of the course. Are you a traveling coach and consultant now, or are you planning at any time to go back to building products? Because you have this kind of vague sentence in your bio on your website that says, I'm currently working with a small team to invent the next generation of creative tools for the early stage of engineering and design projects. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Well, what I've understood is that if we lead, or what I believe at least, is that if we lead with, with new tools, but people don't have the different way of thinking first, that nobody's going to value the tools and they're going to say, this tool doesn't work. For example, uh, I, I did I, I built together with uh, um, with Bob Mesta and some friends. We 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 built a tool for doing job to be done interview analysis, mm -hmm. and it's quite sophisticated. I mean, it's basically producing a kind of a kind of embedding where you can uh, figure out kind of the the mathematical distance between different stories in a job and stuff like that. It's like mm -hmm. it's an amazing tool, and uh, we use it on all of our on all of our projects now. But uh, if you if you haven't really understood the how to get the these four forces from jobs to be done out of interviews, it's garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, and it's kind of like this tool doesn't do anything, and so we we only even give access to the tool to people who are already pretty really well trained in interview technique, and then they're like, oh wow, you know, then they understand what it's doing for them and they can value it. I think the same thing is true for all the tooling around this stuff. So first of all, I, you know, I'm continuing to, I have a lot of stuff that's prototyped that I use on my own projects, but I don't think it's the right time to actually make any of that stuff public. Um, we have a, a little bit of some prototyping going on. Some people are using a handoff tool uh, that mm -hmm. I built out there in the wild. Uh, the, I'm certainly not thinking myself as a traveling coach. Okay. Uh, <laughs> My my uh, so so Katya and I really enjoyed uh, making the making the course, and what the course has allowed us to do is actually to bring more people in to the new way, the, the kind of the latest thinking and and this sort of two point level of of shape up, and uh, but the the consulting projects that I'm doing are projects where. I go into a team where I would not have been able to give them the answer up front and where the course doesn't have the answer for them. But there's something harder. There's something, you know, unique or really difficult or something that I don't understand and they don't understand in their circumstance. And then the consulting project is a way to really extend the framework and innovate and like figure out, like really push the edges of, of what I already know how to explain. So I'm doing one or two of those a year. They're very selective And I usually embed for about a quarter, you know, with the team. So like three months of um, kind of part time, but but very hands on with what's going on in the team. And then that's actually been a source of a lot of the new stuff that's coming out. So, for example, I just did a project where we applied framing and shaping and spiking to a marketing team. And this was totally different than what a product team does but at the same time it was exactly the same stuff you know what i mean so uh it's really interesting so i'm doing occasional consulting projects to really kind of extend um and deepen my understanding of how this can be applied in different tricky contexts and uh in the meanwhile we're continuing to do cohorts of the course uh, we're doing a few of those per year and that's going really well and we're excited about that and i would love to do some tooling but let's see let's see when the time comes and uh, when it fits. Yeah. I'm also, you know, and the other thing is, you know, building software is actually very time consuming. And then you have to maintain and operate what you built and you have to keep all the servers running and you have to keep updating everything to the latest version. And actually the operation side of the software business is 
it's it's harder than people think once you actually mm-hmm. start to get customers and you have to support stuff. So I think it also could be interesting to see maybe in the future there's a possibility to, to partner with some people where the tooling side is a little bit of a slightly different business than the than the teaching and the figuring out the yeah. method side. That sounds great. I'll be looking forward to anything that gets released or announced in that direction. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, this has been a blast. Uh, if people want to connect with you, how should they do that? Yeah, so they can find me on on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and uh, my website, feltpresence.com, is a great place to start. You'll see that Shaping in a Nutshell video, and that's also a place to see what's happening with shaping in real life and anything else that's available. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, David. Really enjoyed it. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Ryan as much as I did. If you like this show, it really goes a long way if you leave a favorable review wherever you are listening to this. And if you're interested to find jobs at companies that work with ShapeUp, we've actually set up a dedicated job board at shapers.builders. Yep, that's the domain. So go ahead and check that out if you're interested. But for now, thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.